cab town. Which is an art installation in itself. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, it, you know, just our handhold. Yes, it was like a frail dowager chewing wasps. <laughs> and people like Joey, all the people you speak to, they seem to have a very positive memory of, of all. And there must have been people who felt ripped off. I mean, there's the guy who did the silk screen paintings for him. He even came up with the overlapping Elvis idea, but yeah. earned, you said, $30. That's right. The guy you're referring to was Gerard Malanga. He was paid the then minimum wage of $1.25. He worked out that on the coloured Mona Lisa, which recently sold at Christie's for north of $50 million, he'd put in 23 and a half hours and he was paid 30 bucks. But they're not bitter. No. What, did you try to find others who might have been less positive about Andy? Or just, are there no people like that left alive? Well, a lot of the people who gravitated to the factory crashed and burned. And that's one of the charges, if you like, against Warhol, that he looked on with a kind of glassy ecstasy, what John Updike called his deadpan rapture, as some of these individuals struggled with their drugs problems and he didn't lift a finger to help. But I spoke to a wonderful guy called Jonas Mikas, now in his 90s, and he was the one who patiently laced up Andy's eight-hour films of the Empire State Building. And he said to me, listen, those people would have been dead a lot sooner if it wasn't for Andy. He was the perfect father. There's something quite fun about the old technology you explore in the room. You use a reel-to-reel -reel recorder to fit some of your interviews. And the old camera film that he would have used in making his films, how far do you think that technology was essential to Warhol? And how far is it entirely irrelevant, given that, in the end, the whole selfie culture of today is something you feel is very much Andy Warhol's world? Well, like Joey, who said he was a dork, the reason that he hit it off with Andy was he was a dork. He went everywhere with his tape recorder and called it his wife. And he Watch out, roadworks reported on the road ahead. Polaroids, that was the raw material that he would turn into a silk screen print. But who knew, I did, that he also used the photo booth. And he had a well-to-do socialite, a lady called Ethel Skull, sit to him in a photo booth. He did her portrait for a, for a handful of quarters, then sold it to her the equivalent of 6,000 bucks in today's money. And of course, it, if it was ever on the open market, it would be worth millions. But you seem to feel, and it's actually quite poignant at the end of the documentary where you're standing in Times Square with his images projected all around you, this idea that he was ahead of his time. His world is the one that we live in today. I think he was extraordinarily prescient. Perhaps his most famous quote is, in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. That hasn't quite come true, but a lot of us go around as if we hope it will be. Look at the rise of reality TV. Here's a photo of what I had for lunch. And as you say, the selfies that we're obsessed with and deluged by. If you're looking for somebody to credit or blame for all that, I don't think you need to look further than Andrew Warhola. His documentary, A Day in the Life of Andy Warhol, is on BBC4 next Tuesday at 9pm. Tomorrow, a review of the film Bad Education, starring Jack Whitehall, and the pianist Andreas Schiff on taking on the Goldberg variations. Do you join me at 7.15? Front Row was presented by Samira Ahmed and produced by Anna Bailey. Our weekend arts programme is presented by Tom Sutcliffe. He's here now with a look ahead. In August, the cultural compass always swings to point towards Edinburgh, and Saturday Review likes to follow it. I'll be there this year in the company of three writers, Ian Rankin, Louise Welsh and James Runsey. Among the things we'll be going to see is the premiere of Teatro de Complicité's new production, The Encounter. My guests will also be talking about their picks from the huge brand hub of theatre, art and comedy that the festival offers. So share our excursion, Festival Review, here on BBC Radio 4 this Saturday evening. Watch out, roadworks reported on the road ahead. Festivals of all sorts are fast becoming significant events in more and more people's calendars. But what if you could create your own? Not just the guests and the acts, but even the weather. Baroness Mary Warnock gets the chance to put her fantasy festival together. It's tonight at half past nine. And now on Radio 4, The Pillow Book by Robert Forrest. Lieutenant Yukunari finds himself held hostage by a childhood friend, while within the palace, Lady Shonovan investigates his disappearance.
sends me to question Lord Asaji. And again, he arranges my disappearance. Another move. They shuffle me around the board and send messages to each other. Test each other's strength, the resolve. But, but what's the prize? I mean, if one of them wins the game. Power, I suppose. Could you please untie my legs? Oh, I've got more trouble than an empty. I can't even wiggle my toes. The empty? Heavy. Well, you can start with the Chancellor. Chancellor, Privy Councillors, High Lords and Princes, Priests. I've been coming and going in that place for years and I'm still amazed. Mortals, fell in the dream. Which one? The only one that makes no problem. My legs, Takashi. Enjoy. I don't know what's up with the roof. No thanks. Watch out. Roadworks reported on the road ahead. Who's that? seen you out of this palace and into a hovel in the provinces. It should see that peasant stripped of his rank, it may be said. There has been no scandal. But there have been whispers. <laughs> Under another regime, you both would be whipped out of this city. Another regime? Are we to discuss politics, Lord Sergi? No. <laughs> that is not a fit subject for a lady companion and a great lord. What subject, then? Flouting of palace decency. Or perhaps. palace language? Yes. Enough. 